بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters in Islam Of the most fundamental principles in our religion of Islam in fact, the fundamental upon which all other fundamentals are based is that we have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a very noble purpose. And that purpose is the worship of Allah. So the purpose of our life is the worship of Allah. As Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have only created man and jinn for the sole reason of worshipping me. Hence our kalima, which is the gist of our religion of Islam, is La ilaha illallah. There is no deity, no being that is worthy of my worship, of my veneration, of my love, of my hope, of my prostration, of my dua, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there can be no goal that is more dignified, more noble, more blessed than this worship. And so... Allow me today to discuss certain aspects related to this concept of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me discuss four different characteristics or four different aspects. The first of these aspects, why do we worship Allah? What is the reason that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for? The second of these aspects, how do we worship Allah? In other words, what do we do in order to do this concept of worship? The third aspect, what do we do to perfect the worship of Allah? And the final aspect, what are the levels of worship? So these are the four aspects that I'll touch upon insha'Allah in today's talk. The first of them, why do we worship Allah? What is the reason why we worship Allah? The second of them, how do we worship Allah? The third, what do we do to perfect this worship once we know how? And the last, what are the primary levels of this worship? Now the first question, why do we worship Allah? If somebody were to come to you and say, why do you worship Allah? The majority of Muslims, many of us would respond, we worship Allah because Allah has created us. We worship Allah because Allah has given me a life. He's guided me to Islam. He's given me this and that. So you would say, for the most part, many Muslims would say, in fact, even non-Muslims who worship God, why do you worship God? Because He did this to me. And so, worship becomes a transaction if you have this frame of mind. Because Allah did this for me, I will do this for Him. And this concept is fundamentally incorrect in Islam. No doubt, one of the reasons why we worship Allah is to thank Him because of what He has done for us. But that's one of the minor reasons. The fundamental reason why we worship Allah has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with us. It has to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We worship Allah primarily because of who Allah is and not because of who we are. We worship Allah because He is worthy of that veneration and worship. Because to Him belong the most perfect names and the most beautiful attributes. Because He is the All-Majestic and Almighty. Because He is all-perfect and we are imperfect. And a part of being imperfect is to recognize perfection when it exists. A part and parcel of being imperfect, which is what we are, is to acknowledge the perfection present in a perfect being. And this is what we call worship. The only perfect being is Allah. Therefore, every single creation which is imperfect, inherently acknowledges the beauty of the all-perfect. So if somebody asks the Muslim who is knowledgeable of his religion, why do you worship Allah? The response should be, we worship Allah because He is worthy of being worshipped. He is worthy of this worship regardless of what He's done to me and to other people. And that is why Allah tells us in the Qur'an that He is worthy of worship before the creation was created. And He shall be worthy of worship after the creation perishes. وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ فِي الْأُولَى وَالْآخِرَةِ 
To Allah belongs hamd, which is the essence of, of worship, praise. In the beginning, before there was anything. And in the end, after all shall be destroyed. So to Allah belongs all perfection and worship. Before we were we, before there was a we. And to Him shall belong worship after we are no longer here. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped because of who He is. Now no doubt, let not somebody misunderstand. One of the factors, one of the factors why we worship Allah is because of the fact He has created us, that He has guided us to Islam, that He has done this and that for us, no doubt. But this is not the primary reason, nor the ultimate, nor the fundamental cause of worship. The fundamental cause of worship has to do with Allah and not with us. And of the best examples to illustrate this point is that of the best human being ever created by Allah, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No human being walked the face of this earth more noble and more holy and more perfect of a worshiper than him. And yet, what did he say in the middle of the night as he was praying to Hajjud? not even realizing that somebody was overhearing him, his wife Aisha was overhearing him, speaking to Allah privately and secretly in his prostration. He would say, Subhanaka, la uhsi thana'an alayka anta kama athnayta ala nafsik. Oh Allah, how exalted are you? I can never do justice in praising you. Who is saying this? The one who is the most perfect worshiper of Allah. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When is he saying this? He is saying this during the most blessed period of the day and night, the last third of the night. In what state is he in? He is in the state of prostration, which is the holiest state a man can be in. So the best man, in the best time, and the best frame, and the best posture, he is acknowledging, Oh Allah, I cannot worship you the way you deserve to be worshipped. Rather, you are as you have praised yourself. Only you, O oh Allah, can do justice to praising you. I cannot do justice. If this is the case with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how about the case with those lesser than him such as us? Another example that really illustrates this point is that of the angels. The angels are a creation that have no free will as you all know. Their sole purpose in life is to execute the commandments of Allah. And while they do that, they worship Allah constantly. They pray, they do dhikr, they prostrate. The Prophet ﷺ said in a beautiful hadith, he said, the skies above us are creaking. You know when something is on wood, it creaks, something heavy. The skies above us are creaking and they have every right to creak. Why? He said there is not a single space, the width of a hand, a hand span, except that there is an angel doing dhikr or rukur or prostration to Allah. This is the skies above us. The Prophet ﷺ is telling us the sheer quantity of angels. And Allah tells us in the Qur'an that these angels, they worship Allah without eating, without drinking, without sleeping, without becoming tired. Imagine constantly doing this type of worship. Additionally, the angels have been created eons before the creation of Adam. We have no understanding of the time frame when the angels were created. And they shall live long after the destruction of earth and all that is on it. So the angels do not procreate. The same angels have existed from time immemorial until the trumpet is blown. And when the trumpet is blown, Allah will take the souls of even the angels. Now imagine now, these are the angels of Allah worshipping in this manner and form, constantly. What will they say when the trumpet is blown and they face death? After having worshipped Allah in this manner, the Prophet ﷺ told us that the angels will say, Subhanaka ya Rabbana, exalted are you, O our Lord, ma abadnaka haqqa ibadati. We have not worshipped you the way you deserve to be worshipped. We have not worshipped you the way you deserve to be worshipped. These are the angels acknowledging, we haven't done justice, O Allah, to your worship. And this is after what they have done. Imagine now in our scenarios, we worship Allah a measly 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Even these 30, 40 years, what, 20, 30 minutes a day, we stand up for prayer, for salah, for zakah, whatever we do. And we think we have accomplished a lot. Look at the angels who are sinless, never committed a sin. 
worshipping Allah for a time span, our limited minds cannot even understand. We can't even comprehend this infinity. And when they face death, they blurt out a praise which really and truly shows us who we are. And that praise is, oh Allah, we have done nothing. We have not worshipped you the way that you deserve to be worshipped. So Allah is worshipped primarily because of who Allah is. When we study the names and attributes of Allah, when we learn about who our Creator is through the Quran and Sunnah, the Rahman and the Rahim, the Malik and the Quddus, the Salam and the Mu'min, the Aziz and the Jabbar, the Tawwab and the Ghaffar, each and every name, it brings about a humility, a humbleness, a consciousness, a servitude that really and truly shows us that we are nothing in comparison to the All Majestic, the Almighty. Allah is worshipped because of who He is and not because of what He has done for us. Now no doubt there are other secondary factors of worship as well. Time does not permit us to get into all of those factors. Of them as I said is the fact that Allah has created us. Yes, one of the reasons why we worship Allah is to thank Him for what He has done. And of the reasons we want to attain His pleasure which is Jannah. And we want to abstain and, see, and seek refuge from His punishment and evil which is the fire of hell. This too is a reason. It is not a trivial reason, it is a reason, but it is not the fundamental reason. So to answer the first question, and that is why do we worship Allah? We say there is one primary reason and many secondary reasons. And the primary reason overshadows all of these secondary reasons put together. Allah is worshipped because of who He is. Even if Allah did not create me and you and all of the creation, He would be worthy of worship. How much more so when He has done all of this and guided us to Islam and given us each and everything that we have. As Allah says in the Quran, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا If you were to try to count the blessings of Allah, just sit down and count. Think, oh Allah, you have given me a life. You have given me these parents. You have given me this society. You have given me this wealth, this, this, this. If you were to try to count the blessings of Allah, Allah says you wouldn't even be able to list them. If you can't even list those blessings, how do you expect to thank Allah when the list itself is infinite? So we worship Allah because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not because of us. The second of the four issues that we'll discuss today, and that is how do we worship Allah? What do we do in order to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Realize, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped by a specific set of beliefs and by a specific number of statements and by a specific number of actions. Beliefs, statements and actions. And the famous hadith of Jibreel which all of you know, it summarizes the essence of all of these characteristics. It summarizes the essence of what we have to believe and what we have to do in order to worship Allah. The famous hadith of Jibreel you all know the hadith and there are many versions of the hadith. One of these versions is narrated by Abu Hurairah who said that the Prophet وسلم, asked the companions, he said, ask me something about your religion. But the companions were too shy. Out of respect, they didn't ask. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His mercy sent a questioner. When the companions did not ask, Allah sent somebody else to ask. And he sent the best of all questioners to the best of all prophets in the best of all masjids and the best of all gatherings out of the companions. So he sent the angel Jibreel while the companions were present. And the angel Jibreel asked our beloved Prophet wasallam a series of simple questions that all of you know. What is faith? What is Iman? And we know Iman is to believe in Allah and the six pillars of Iman. Jibreel then asked, what is Islam? In the version of Abu Huraira, Iman is asked before Islam. In the version of Umar ibn al-Khattab, which is a more famous version, Islam is asked before Iman. So the Prophet ﷺ was asked, what is Islam? And he gave the five pillars of Islam, the action-based pillars. And that is, you say the shahada, you pray the five prayers, you give the zakah, you fast the month of Ramadan, and you go for hajj if you're able to do so. And then he was asked, what is Ihsan? And he was given the response, Ihsan is that you worship Allah as though you see Him. Even if you do not see Him, He sees you. So this hadith of Jibreel, which really and truly is the fundamental basis of our religion, 
our theology stems from this hadith. Our fiqh and legal ruling stem from this hadith. Our suluk and our relationship with Allah stems from this hadith. This hadith summarizes the basics of what we have to believe and say and do. And this hadith is known to all of us. Now there are more branches as well, but this hadith summarizes the essential pillars of theology and faith and actions and statements. Now the third issue is we all know we have to pray, we have to fast, we have to do the five pillars. The third issue, which is really one of the crux uh, of, of the matters, we all know we have to pray. How do we perfect the prayer? How do we really and truly motivate ourselves to be better Muslims, to implement all of these actions and all of these beliefs that we know are found in the hadith of Jibreel? And the answer to this question, once again, is manifold. There are many things that we can do. But again, time permits me only to concentrate on one of them. Of the best ways to revive, to rejuvenate our spirit, of the best ways to imbue ourselves with servitude of Allah, to increase our consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is through knowledge. Nothing brings about spirituality like knowledge does. Nothing brings about a sense of perfection, a sense of consciousness of Allah, like knowledge does. A person stands up to pray, and the Prophet ﷺ said, it is possible that nothing is written for him of his prayer. Another one stands up to pray right next to him, he'll get one-tenth. Another one will get two-tenth, until the tenth one will get the entire rewards of the prayer. Outwardly, they're doing the same things. Outwardly, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. They're all saying, Allahu Akbar, going into Rukur, standing up, going into sujood. What then makes the one get nothing and the other get a perfect reward? It is the inner spirituality, the motivation, the religiosity that is present in the heart. So then I said, how do we revive this spirituality? I said, there are many ways. The primary way is through knowledge. And when I say knowledge, let me concentrate on two different aspects of knowledge. The first aspect of knowledge is, let me call it the theory of what we're doing. The theory and practice, put it together. In other words, reading about how we should pray. What we call in Arabic, fiqh. We all know we have to say Allahu Akbar. We all know we put our hands here. We all know we go down into ruku'. Open up any book of fiqh or any book of hadith. And read. Read for yourself. The Prophet wasallam stood up to pray and he said Allahu Akbar. It's not possible that when you stand up to pray and you say Allahu Akbar, accept that, you're going to get a mental image. You're going to get a feeling of attachment. I am doing exactly what my Prophet did. The concept is the same. You're going to read that the Prophet would go into ruku' and he would say, Subhana Rabbi Al Azim three times. We all know this. But when you open it up and you read it for yourself, that the Prophet would do this, automatically that gives you a sense of attachment and connecting. Read the books of fiqh. The books of fiqh will tell you what are the fundamental aspects of prayer that you have to do. What are the pillars and the wajibat? What are the sunan? What are that which is encouraged? And what breaks the prayer? Now for the most part, we don't know these things. We should know them. We don't know them. When we learn these things, they might be dry lists. But just try it, just for the prayer. All of a sudden you'll realize saying Allahu Akbar is a rukun, integral part of my prayer. Reading the Fatiha is one of the essential requirements. Reading the Surah after the Fatiha is something which is encouraged but doesn't nullify the prayer. This consciousness which is nothing but knowledge, it will make you automatically more aware, more humble. That's all it is. You're doing the same actions from before as now. But when you have a connection with your religion, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Pray as you have seen me pray. Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Open up any book of hadith. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, Nisa, Ibn Majah, Muatta, any book of hadith. Open up the chapter of the prayer. And just see simple, basic ahadith that are found in these books that you're doing anyway. And then see the next prayer that you pray, how your prayer will automatically have gone up. So the first aspect of knowledge, I said, is the theory and the practice. I put it together. Okay, basically, in, when I say theory here, I mean, for example, in aqidah, there is no practice. In aqidah or theology, what is the belief in Allah? 
What is the belief in the angels? What is the belief in the Day of Judgment? Everybody knows there are angels. When you actually pick up a book about the angels and read hadith after hadith and ayah after ayah, your iman will soar to new limits. And this is what you call knowledge coming into your life. So this is the first aspect of knowledge. The second aspect of knowledge is the science known in Islam as the science of fada'il or the blessings. The blessings are different than the fiqh and the theory and the practice. The blessings, what is the blessing of doing wudu? What are the blessings of fasting? Now we all know doing wudu is a good thing. We all know that, it's part of our prayer. Before we have to pray, we have to stand up and do wudu. And so we wake, wake up in the morning, we're really sleepy, we don't want to wake up, put our eyes open too wide so that the sleepiness doesn't go away. Go into the bathroom, quickly splash ourselves, you know, go move up and down and jump back into bed, okay? Standard routine of fajr, at least I hope at least that's what we're doing, the bare minimum, okay? The standard routine of fajr. Now, we do wudu, all of us do wudu. When you study the blessings of wudu, once again, it's not possible that you will continue in your wudu in the same way anymore after that. When you study, for example, that the Prophet ﷺ said that every drop of water that touches your skin and falls down takes a sin with it. It sucks away a sin. Now you tell me you're standing in front of the sink. Are you not going to remember every sin that you have done in the last few hours? Your eyes have seen things, your mouth has said things, your hands have touched things, your feet have walked to places, and you will say, Alhamdulillah, I'm doing wudu now. And that consciousness, that reality, that servitude, that worship is going to come into your act. Just by knowing the blessings of wudu. You all know wudu is a sacred and a good thing to do. The Sahaba said, the Prophet ﷺ told us that on the day of judgment, he will see all of mankind standing there. And everyone will be asking for water. The sun will come close to the earth. There will be no shade. Everyone will be sweating and hot. A type of thirst we can't even imagine. Everyone is screaming and begging for water. There is only one source of water. And that is the hawd or the, the pool of the Prophet ﷺ. And so the Prophet ﷺ told the companions, I will be standing there inviting you to drink. You need an invitation to drink. You cannot just go and drink. The Prophet himself وسلم, has to invite every single one of us. May Allah make us amongst the invitees on that day. He has to invite every one of us if we want to drink from that hawd. The Sahaba were shocked. They said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, how will you recognize the masses of Muslims from those who are not Muslims? He said, my ummah will come shining bright from the symptoms and signs of wudu. The wudu will make your limbs white, shining. And the Prophet ﷺ will pick you apart from the rest of mankind because of the wudu that you used to do. I challenge you to do wudu with the same spirituality that you did knowing this hadith. You can't. You can't. You will now be conscious. This wudu is what will mark me as a Muslim. It will be my invitation pass to get to drink on the day of judgment. One hadith will change inshallah the rest of your life when you do wudu. And this applies to every single act of worship. From the prayer, to the fast, to the charity, to the dhikr, to the hajj, every act of worship. We have to read this, this field I said called fada'il, or the blessings. What are the blessings of this, of, this, of this act? And when we study the blessings of an act, automatically, as I said, it imbues us with a type of consciousness that can never be present otherwise. And never again will you trivialize this thing called wudu. The Prophet ﷺ also said that, do you know, in one hadith he said, do you know what the angels are arguing about? Which, of, which is the best deed? Which deed is the best deed? They're arguing about it. Do you know what qualifies on this list? They said, Allah and His Messenger knows best. Allah and His Messenger know best. He said, of the things that qualify to be the best of all deeds that a man can ever do. He said, to perform wudu on a cold morning with cold water. To perform wudu on a cold morning with cold water. So you're f waking up for fajr. And we're talking about when there are no hot water taps, mashallah, the convenience. We sit there for two minutes waiting for the hot tap to come and we still complain. Okay? We're talking about a time when the sahaba would wake up and it is sub-zero temperatures in some places. And they have nothing except that flask of water there. Maybe even ice that they have to make it, you know. Uh, in Medina, it does get below, below freezing sometimes. And so they're doing wudu on that freezing night in the open. And the Prophet ﷺ said, this deed 
to perfect your wudu at that time and place, this is one of the best deeds a human being can possibly do. Will anybody ever complain now about the difficulties of doing wudu when they know that the angels are arguing this might be the single best deed that any human being can ever do? And in order to talk about fada'il, fada'il is a topic in and of itself. What I want you to do, every single one of you, is to buy one book, just one book. And this book is called Riyadu Salihin by Imam al Nawawi. Imam al Nawawi, the famous Imam, all of you know. Okay? This book, Riyadu Salihin, really and truly is a blessed book. It is a Mubarak book. It is a book that Imam al Nawawi wrote for the average Muslims, me and you, not for the scholars. It is a book, all it does, it compiles simple hadith. Hadith, you don't need a, a, a scholar to understand. You don't need a PhD in jurisprudence or aqidah. Simple hadith that talk to me and you about, mainly about fada'il. You look up the blessings of wudu, the dangers of becoming angry, okay? The importance of ikhlas, sincerity. And you read and you understand. So you put this connection with you and the text, the Qur'an and Sunnah, and automatically your spirituality, your servitude, your ubudiyah, we call it in Arabic, will go to heights that are unparalleled in your life. And as I said, the irony is, we're doing the same things. We're all doing wudu. We're all doing the motions of prayer. Just an ounce of knowledge will really and truly change that. It will give us that spirituality that is lacking in our lives. And so the third question, we had four issues, those of you, those of you that came late, where we're going to discuss four issues in this talk. The first of these issues, why do we worship Allah? The second of them, how do we worship Allah? The third of them, what do we do to perfect that worship of Allah? And the fourth of them is, what are the levels of this worship? Now, as I said, the concept of fada'il is a topic we can talk very, very, uh, you know, long time about, about the topic of uh, the prayer uh, the, the salah, the, the, the fasting, the charity. So I encourage you to go to this book. And this one book really and truly will do the job. And another point, don't just read it once and that's it. No. Mankind, the Prophet ﷺ said, our heart becomes rusted. Our heart becomes dry. We have to always clean it, always soften it. Every time you read a hadith, it has an impact on you. And then you will come across it a year or two or five years later. And subhanAllah, it is as if you read the hadith for the first time. It will have another impact on you. And so don't just think, okay, I know this hadith, then move on. No, have it a constant part of your daily routine and life. That I will spend a few minutes a day with the Qur'an. The Qur'an is the best antidote to the rust of the heart. That's the Prophet ﷺ said, one of the best antidotes. And a few minutes a day with the sunnah. Make this a part of your schedule. We have, mashallah, plenty of time for every single secular science under the sun. Okay, we're studying for, you know, chemistry, engineering, medicine, mathematics. We have these textbooks, which really and truly, when I look at them, my mind boggles. These huge thousand page textbooks. And I'm shocked, did that actually do that in one or two semesters? I went through all of, 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 of calculus, all of organic chemistry, of, of chemistry, of physics. And I know all of this stuff, or technically I'm supposed to know it. And it really and truly makes me feel ashamed of myself. That I have done this entire textbook cover to cover. I've memorized everything. I understand the concepts. And I haven't even spent a fraction of that time. And this is just one subject. In my undergraduate careers, if I have all of the books there, subhanAllah, I don't even want to see how much I must have done for that. I haven't even spent a fraction of that on my own religion. This should make us feel ashamed. We have the time and the effort to study everything that we need to for our degrees and education. And that's fine, alhamdulillah. But at least spend a, reason, spend a reasonable amount of time with your religion as well. And as I said, Quran and Sunnah, the two fundamental bases. The, th the last issue that we're going to discuss is... What are the levels of the worship of Allah? What are the levels of worship that we have? And the answer to this question is also found in the same hadith of Jibreel. The hadith of Jibreel tells us that there are three levels of worship in Islam. The first of these levels is the level of Islam. The second level, which is higher, is the level of Iman. And the third level is the level of Ihsan. 
So our beloved Prophet ﷺ has given us the basic outline of the levels of worship of Allah. And he has told us that there are three primary categories of worship. You have the Muslim, you have the Mu'min, and you have the, the Muhsin. Okay? What makes a person a Muslim versus a Muhsin versus a Mu'min? What are the things that you have to do in order to get from one level to the next? Well, a Muslim, a Muslim is one who performs the bare minimum of our religion of Islam, which is the five pillars. A Muslim is one who, out of the fard prayers, all he prays are the obligatory ones. Out of the fasts, all he does is the month of Ramadan. Out of the charity, all that person does is the 2.5% and also the zakat al-fitr. And if he's qualified to go for hajj, he goes for hajj once in his lifetime. To get to this level is the bare minimum of Islam. A Bedouin came to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked in the famous hadith, he asked, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, how many prayers do I have to pray? The Prophet ﷺ said, five prayers. He said, anything else, more or less? The Prophet ﷺ said, no, unless you want to do charity, unless you want to you know, be generous and do more. He then said about the fasting. How many times do I have to fast? He said, one month. The man said, any more than this? The Prophet said, no, unless you want to be generous and do some nothing. And he went on with the other pillars of Islam. When at the end of the hadith, this Bedouin said, I swear by Allah, I will not do one iota, one atom's weight more or less than this bare minimum. So out of the fard, out of the salah, he'll only pray the fard. Two, four, four, three, four, that's it. Out of the fasting, only the 29, 30 days of Ramadan. Out of the zakat, the bare minimum, so on and so forth. The sahaba were in a state of shock. They thought this guy, that's it man, he's gone. There's no way he's gonna pass. I mean, he's doing nothing. You see, back then to do this was to do nothing. In our times to do this, mashallah, you're really practicing brother, mashallah, okay? <laughs> it's like back then the sahaba were like, this guy is, that's it, there's no hope for him. There's no way he's gonna pass. The Prophet doesn't calm them down. He said, no. Aflaha in sadaq. If he is able to fulfill the conditions, he will pass. He will pass. Look at how times have changed, subhanAllah. That the sahaba could not, they couldn't imagine this person being a good Muslim. Because a Bedouin comes, an innocent guy, I mean a Bedouin guy, the Bedouins are coarse, harsh, you know, very, very, um, you know, brutally honest. And he said, I'm not gonna pray a single nafil prayer in my life. The Sahaba thought, miskeen, poor guy, that's it. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, no, this is all Allah requires. If he does the bare minimum, alhamdulillah, he will pass the, t the test <clears throat> and he will enter Jannah. So you see, and of course, as I said in our time, subhanAllah, how few, I mean, you know, off the top of my head, a, a rough figure, I would say, of my own experiences dealing with the, with the Muslim ummah, I would say less than 20% of the ummah. Okay, maybe even that's a too generous of a figure, Allahu A'lam. Even reaches this level that the Bedouin, whom the Sahaba thought would not succeed, reaches. How many amongst us even pray the five times a day? Much less the other pillars of Islam. The point being that, this is the level of Islam. Once we reach this level, we have reached the level of being a Muslim. Meaning that if we are below this level, then our Islam is deficient. Doesn't mean you become a kafir, a'udhu billah. It means your Islam is deficient. You are not a perfect Muslim. Okay? Because Islam is of levels, it's not black and white. It's not just a simple criterion that you're either a good Muslim or you're a kafir. There are millions of levels in between. And there is no doubt a line that se separates Muslim from kufr. But the bare minimum of being a Muslim is to do the five pillars of Islam. If you don't do these five pillars, then you are not a full Muslim. You're not a kafir, remember, don't misquote me on that. But you haven't reached the level of Islam that this Bedouin had and that the hadith of Jibreel tells us. You are basically a bad Muslim, or we call it in Arabic, a fasiq, or an evil person. Okay, as long as you have the bare minimum of iman, which is a separate uh, topic. So this is what Islam is, to do the five pillars. A higher level is that of iman. And the scholars have defined iman, is that you do the bare minimum, and you do the regular sunan, and you do occasional nafil. 
So what separates a Muslim from a mu'min? The mu'min is doing the bare minimum, just like the Muslim, but he's also doing the regular sunans. So the Prophet ﷺ had some regular sunnas. Of the day, there were 12 rak'ahs he would pray every single day when he wasn't traveling. The two before Fajr, you know, the four before and after Dhuhr, the two after Maghrib, uh, and, the, and the two after Isha, so on and so forth. So he had these regular, and the witr as well, he had these regular sunans. Of the fasting, he had regular fasts as well, Monday and Thursday, and the three days of the month, and so on and so forth. Of the charity, he had some regular charities that he would give. He would, all, he would never deny somebody who asked him, and so on and so forth. So every single deed has that which is fard. And it has that which is sunnah, which the Prophet would regularly do, and it has nafil, which he would not do regularly, he would do occasionally. The mu'min reaches the level that he reaches through the quantity of actions. The mu'min increases. He fasts more, prays more, he'll have more of a relationship with the Qur'an, a little bit of tahajjud, a little bit of dhikr, a little bit of dua, so he'll have more than the Muslim. Simple enough to understand. What makes a person rise from the level of Iman to the level of Ihsan? This is the key question. The level of Islam to Iman, very simple to understand. And that is quantity of actions. We just do more. We pray the five prayers and we also pray the regular sunnahs that the Prophet would pray. We fast the month of Ramadan and we fast also the days that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to fast and so on and so forth. But what makes a person rise from the level of Iman to the level of Ihsan? How did the Prophet ﷺ define Ihsan? He defined Ihsan to be the one who worships Allah as though Allah as though he is seeing Allah. Because even if he does not see Allah, Allah sees him. In other words, he is worshipping Allah 24-7. Always, constantly worshipping Allah. There is never a break in the worship. That's the level of the angels, right? That's the level of the angels. That the angels worship Allah without ever stopping. So the muhsin reaches the level of the angels in terms of the worship. But the question arises, how? How does a human being become an angel? He can never become an angel. Does the muhsin cut away from society, live in a cave, fast every day, pray tahajjud every night, worship Allah with dhikr and dua and Quran, avoid all the pleasures of this world? Some people say yes. Some groups of Islam, other religions, Buddhism, certain groups of Christianity, they say, yes, this, if you want to become the elite of the elite, if you want to really and truly become a God-fearing worshiper, then this is what you have to do. You have to cut yourself off from the pleasures of this world and try to imitate the angels. You sleep the bare minimum two, three hours a day because you have to. You eat the coarsest of foods, just a piece of bread and some water. And you go and live in the caves and you worship and you meditate and you contemplate and you do nothing of this world. So for them, and you have some groups within the ummah as well, that they think this is the way that we have to worship Allah by the level of ihsan. But let me ask you, is this the way of our beloved Prophet wasallam? Is this what he did? Or the companions? Or the famous imams? Or the famous scholars of hadith and tafsir and fiqh? The people we look up to, we treasure. Is this their methodology? The answer is a resounding no, not at all. They worshipped Allah and they lived their lives. They went to the marketplaces, they bought and sold, they married, they had children. They lived like human beings, not like angels. And yet they reached the level of ihsan. So how? How does one reach the level of worshipping Allah constantly when you're still living in this world? When you're still limited by being a human. When you still have to do things that humans have to do. Herein, my brothers and sisters in Islam, lies the beauty of our religion of Islam. It is this facet of Islam that many people do not understand. And it is what separates a mu'min from a muhsin. And that is that for the mu'min, 
the world is a dichotomy. Even the mu'min. The mu'min goes to work. And he looks at his watch, he says, I have to pray at 1.30. And so he's going to work. When it comes 1.30, he will make sure he goes out, he prays his prayer, prays his sunnah, prays his nafil, makes his dhikr and dua, comes back to work. The mu'min lives his life, socializes with his friends. He goes, Friday night I have a halaqa, I'm going to go attend some religious knowledge. So he goes there. This is the mu'min. So he has what he calls the secular and what he calls the religious or sacred. He has this dichotomy of the world, two vision of the world. He separates or she separates the life between what is worldly, I'm doing this for this world, and what is religious. The muhsin transcends this division. And there is no division of worldly versus religious, of secular versus sacred. For the muhsin, everything becomes religious. And this is the beauty of Islam. That we can do an act that is quote-unquote worldly, going to work for a paycheck. This is not a primarily religious function. Eating and drinking, it is not primarily a religious function. Marrying and having children, this is not primarily a religious function. Everybody does it, Muslim and non-Muslim, the pious Muslim and the evil Muslim, the kafir and the mu'min, everybody does this. But the muhsin is the only one who does it and converts it into an act of worship. How? How does the muhsin do this? Very simple. Exactly as the Prophet ﷺ said. He defined for us the level of ihsan. He said, it is as though he sees Allah, even though he doesn't see Allah, Allah sees him. In other words, the muhsin has a consciousness of Allah that no one else has. The muhsin is always thinking of Allah. He's always appreciating the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching over him, looking at him. And so, when the muhsin goes to work, he doesn't think only 1.30 I have to pray. He thinks to himself, Oh Allah, you have given me health and wealth and talents, and you have obliged upon me to take care of myself. And so I am using these blessings to go to work, to feed myself. And if he has family, he will say, Oh Allah, you have blessed me with a wife, with children. And it is my duty to take care of them. And so I am doing this as an obligation to you. When he sits down to eat, the mu'min does not think of religion except to say, Bismillah. The muhsin thinks, Oh Allah, in order to worship you, I have to feed my physical body. Therefore, allow me to worship you better through this meal. When he goes shopping for his family even, the muhsin is conscious of Allah. Not complaining and saying, oh my God, another, you just, we just, I just got milk for you, you want me to go again? The muhsin realizes, he says, subhanallah, Allah has given me the money and the wealth and the health to take care of these beautiful, precious Muslims. And therefore, I will go and discharge my duty in this manner. And therefore, the Prophet ﷺ said, when you reach this level, even a morsel of food, you put it in your wife's mouth, you will be rewarded. You feed your wife, you will be rewarded. Every single man amongst us wants to take care of his family. That's a part of being a man. It's a part of manlihood. Even non-Muslims, those who don't believe in Allah, this is a part of the fitrah of a man. He wants to take care of the woman he loves and the children he has. Do you think they're all going to get rewarded for this? No. Only the muhsin will get the reward for shopping, for taking care of and providing for his family. Because he's conscious of Allah. You all know the hadith. When the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, the rich amongst us have, have gone further, the Ansar. They have money, we don't have money. They've gone further in their good. The Prophet ﷺ said, to smile in the face of your brother is charity. To do this and that is charity. To be intimate with your spouse is charity. They were shocked. They said, Ya Rasulullah, one of us goes and satisfies his desires and he will get reward for that. Now, every single married one amongst us satisfies his desires. Do you think they're going to get reward for every single act? No, not at all. It is only the muhsin who goes conscious of Allah, realizing this is a need, realizing this is a physical need which he could abuse. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. What if you went to haram? Would you not get a sin? Yes, therefore when you go to halal, you will get a reward. So the muhsin does this deed and he has a consciousness of Allah. And he will get a reward even for this deed. 
Therefore, for the muhsin, every single step he takes, every single place he goes to, every single standing up and sitting down and lying in dhikr and dua, there is no demarcation, there's no dichotomy of religious versus secular. For him, everything is for the sake of Allah. So for the muhsin, and this is the key point, brothers and sisters, it's not the quantity of actions. No. The muhsin and the mu'min outwardly, you probably can't tell them apart. You can't. Once you've reached the perfection of iman, you are fasting Mondays and Thursdays, you're fasting three days of the month, you're praying your tahajjud, you're praying your, your nafil and sunnas. What more can you do? The Prophet ﷺ did this. You can't outdo the Prophet ﷺ, like the three men you all know who came, and they said, is this all the Prophet ﷺ does? I'll do more. I'm gonna do more. They didn't understand ihsan. You can't outdo the Prophet ﷺ. This is your paradigm, this is your role model. Once you've reached that level in terms of outward deeds, this is the beauty of Islam, it's inward spirituality, it's ihsan. So we have to strive to get to the level of iman first and foremost, which I think for the most part, you know, 99.999% of the ummah has not reached, which is to really and truly do the deeds and the sunnahs and do the nafil once in a while. The nafils are not done regularly, the nafils that are outside the sunnah, it is the sunnah to do nafils irregularly. You understand this? Okay, the nafil is not done regularly. The nafil is done, you know, on an occasional basis. So the Prophet would fast Mondays and Thursdays, that's sunnah. To say, I want to fast this week on a Wednesday as well. Excellent. Do it once in a while. But don't do it regularly. The regular sunnahs are other than the nafil. Once we reach the level of iman, what is the click that brings us from iman to ihsan? It's not quantity of actions. It is the quality of deeds. It is not quantity of actions that raises us from iman to ihsan. It is that spirituality, that inner consciousness, that servitude, that worship, ubudiyya of Allah that raises us from iman to ihsan. And I think one of the best incidences to, 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 to demonstrate this point is that of Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala an. Mu'adh ibn Jabal once visited some people. And so they asked him about Mu'adh ibn Jabal, you all know, is the famous companion of the Prophet wasallam, the one whom the Prophet wasallam said, O Mu'adh, I love you for the sake of Allah. How few are the people the Prophet wasallam said this to? And Mu'adh was one of them. O Mu'adh, I love you for the sake of Allah. Mu'adh ibn Jabal once went to visit some friends. And so they asked him, O Mu'adh, knowing who he was, can you describe for us your tahajjud? Look at the topic of conversation. When we go to visit our friends, what is the topic of conversation? The latest scores in the, the basketball or football games, what happened today at work, latest incidents, politics, this and that. When the Sahaba would go visit one another, how much Quran are you reading? How do you pray the Hajjud? What do we do to come closer to Allah? Look at how times have changed. Mu'adh ibn Jabal goes to visit a friend. The first question on their mind, they want to be better Muslims. Mu'adh, how do you pray to Hajjud? Of course, the assumption he didn't even pray, didn't even come to them. That's like a given. You are praying. I want to know how you pray. Okay, it's not in our times. You're going to say, do you even pray five times a day? I mean, before we get to the level of tahajjud, that's like, you know, if you get to tahajjud, mashallah. So they asked Mu'ad, how do you pray tahajjud? What is your, your system? And so he told them, I sleep for this amount of time, and then I stand up for this amount, and then I lie down again, and then I pray fajr. And then he said, and this subhanallah, this phrase, what he concluded, this, this, this description with, Really and truly, it summarizes what I'm talking about. He said, And I expect to be rewarded for my sleep just as much as I expect to be rewarded for the tahajjud. Think about that. I expect to be rewarded for my sleep just as much as I expect to be rewarded for my tahajjud. It is not that Mu'adh is not sleeping. That he spends eight hours non-stop and then he gets half an hour and then he... No! He goes to sleep. He gets a healthy few hours of sleep. And he prays tahajjud. And he has this matter-of-fact statement that astounds and bewilders us. What? What do you mean? You want to be rewarded for sleep just as much as tahajjud? We would understand even if he said, Allah will reward me for my sleep. He said, no. Just as much as tahajjud, I expect Allah to reward me for that. Why? This is what you call the level of ihsan. You're worshipping Allah 24-7, even when you sleep, you expect to be rewarded for Allah. We all sleep, alhamdulillah, I know that much, we all sleep, okay? We might not pray tahajjud, we all sleep. Do we expect to be rewarded for that sleep? 
I don't think so. Not just because we don't break the Hajj, it's because the consciousness that comes. When Mu'adh ibn Jabal will be going to sleep, it is as if he is saying, Oh Allah, in order to worship you perfectly, my body has a right over me, and I need to rest for that tahajjud. Oh Allah, bless me in this sleep, give me the rewards, and allow me to wake up at night to worship you in a better and more rejuvenated manner. So when he changes this natural act of sleep that every single human being does, he is even rewarded for sleeping, and he thinks he will get rewarded just as much as his tahajjud. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the Muhsin, the Muhsin has a constant cycle of worship. Not the five prayers he looks at his watch and then goes back to work. That's the Mu'min or the Muslim. The Muhsin is conscious that Allah is watching him. And so every single step and deed that he does becomes an act of worship. Therefore, never trivialize any deed that you're doing. Never trivialize it. You do not know what Allah will accept from you. Remember the hadith of the prostitute. The Prophet ﷺ told us in Sahih Bukhari. He said in the Bani Israel before you, there was a prostitute. A prostitute who walked by a well and saw a dog thirsty. So thirsty that the dog was licking the sand, trying to find some drops of water around the well. And so the prostitute felt some sympathy for the dog. So she went down into the well. She took her shoe and she pilt, She took some water in it and she gave it to the dog to drink. The Prophet ﷺ said, because of this deed, he said, because of this deed, her sins were all forgiven. This one deed, her sins were all forgiven. We're talking about a prostitute who sells her body for a cheap price, for gold and silver coins. How many are the men she must have deluded? How many are the sins she must have accrued? And she sees now this filthy creature. Our sharia considers the dog to be nudges like the pig. We're not allowed to own one except under dire circumstances. She sees this dog and she, she feels rahmah and sympathy for it. And she recognizes how sinful she is. And she is desperate for any good deed to save her. And so that consciousness of Allah that consciousness of Allah, which allowed her to take out 30 seconds of her day and feed this dog, caused her for all of her sins to be forgiven. It is not the deed itself, a prostitute feeding a dog. It is the spirituality behind the deed. The consciousness that she must have had, realizing how desperate she is for Allah's mercy and forgiveness. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted this one deed from her. One deed, and because of it, forgave all of her sins. The moral of the story, or Muslims, never trivialize any good that you can do. Whatever deed that you do, surely, inshallah, we are better than the prostitute. Surely, the good that we show is more than, than water to a dog. Surely, then, we have more right to be forgiven. But it is not the deed, as I said, it is the spirituality, it is the consciousness. So as you go about your daily lives, as you go about your cycle of life, see the opportunities that come knocking to you for the worship of Allah. And don't trivialize them. Understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indeed watching. And you never know which deed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept of yours. To conclude, let me rephrase the entire uh, you know, talk into two primary points. Summarize it in a different way. Two primary points. Firstly, my brothers and sisters in Islam, be mindful of Allah throughout your day and night. And do not let your time become a monotonous routine of actions that you do, religious and secular. I have to pray at this time, I have to go to work at that time. No, don't do that. Don't fall into this mistake. Rather, aim for the level of ihsan, even though you might not be able to reach it fully. Inshallah, you might be able to reach it partially. Aim for the level of ihsan, which is the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, secondly, do not trivialize any good deed that you do. You do not know what that one deed will be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will like and forgive you because of it. One of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, one of the, one of the famous scholars of the past, he said, if I knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had accepted 
only one prostration of mind that I have done throughout my life. One sajda. I would die optimistic of reaching Jannah. If I knew Allah accepted it, just one sajda, then Allah will accept it. That means He'll give me everything I want from that. Imagine now. And this is a person, he must have had thousands and hundreds of thousands of prostrations. And he says, if I only knew one of those was accepted. Don't trivialize any good deed that you do. And remember that the most rewarding of all deeds are the obligatory deeds. And the most beloved are the punctual ones. These are two hadith, different hadith. The most rewarding of all deeds are the obligatory deeds. The five prayers and the zakat and the fasting of Ramadan. The most rewarded and the most beloved, as the Prophet ﷺ said, are those that are punctual. You always do them. So imagine now the rewarding, the reward that we will get by doing that which is obligatory upon us. The five prayers, the fast, the zakat. Don't trivialize any of that. Let me conclude this talk by quoting a statement of the famous imam and scholar and ascetic and worshipper and zahid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that famous imam, Imam al-Hasan al-Basri. He said, and he's speaking now to the tabi'un, to the second generation after the sahaba, and he's telling them, he said, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu did not precede you. He didn't become who he was because of more fasts and prayers and dhikr. Remember, he's talking to the tabi'un, he's not talking to us. If he were talking to us, that would be a different story. He's talking to people who are praying and fasting and doing what they have to do on dhikr and Quran and tahajjud. He's talking to them. He says, Abu Bakr didn't do more than you. No, you've done basically what the Sahaba are doing. Abu Bakr did not become who he became because of more prayer and charity and dhikr. But he said, but because of something that came into his heart and settled in his consciousness, spirituality. That is what made Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the knowledge and the iman, and the tawfiq, and the understanding to worship him the way that he deserves to be worshipped. Wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka al-abdi wa suri Muhammadin, wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For the muhsin, everything becomes religious. And this is the beauty of Islam.